Game 2 of 2022's finals saw 2017's DPOY and Draymond Green's tenacity get under the skin of the Boston Celtics. We witnessed the typical third quarter Warriors dominate out of the locker room yet again, but this time, Steph Curry and the Dubs closed it out when it mattered most in the fourth quarter. Considering how the dynasty-esque Dubs bounced back in Game 2, while the Celtics stole home court, all the momentum now lays with the Warriors as they fly back to Beantown. So, how did Golden State dramatically shift the personality of this series? What will it take for Boston to bounce back? Before continuing, only 11.4% of you watching right now are subscribed, so if you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss a single upload. Also, please drop a thumbs up. It takes a few seconds and makes a massive difference in YouTube's algorithm. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at DFlowHoops, and I'll follow you back. Link is down below in the description for those two platforms. Both the Golden State Warriors and Boston Celtics are two juggernauts who are seeming like they're about to go at it for a full seven games. But after that game two obliteration from the dubs, right now, they deserve their flowers. Something I haven't talked about enough on this channel for some reason is how mid-series adjustments and also in-game adjustments play such an important factor in an NBA playoff series. In game one, it was the Celtics going from a low drop coverage and allowing six threes on Steph in the first quarter, adjusting to bring the man much closer to the level of the pick and neutralizing Steph in the final three quarters. This time in game two, after Jason Tatum dropped 21 in the opening half, Draymond Green's intimidating one-on-one -on -one defense and the Dubs' collective stinginess to constantly send multiple defenders at him kept Tatum under control after the Celtics superstar seemed to be looking unstoppable early on. You love him if he's on your side and you hate him if he's not, almost like a presence Marcus Smart provides for Boston, but Draymond Green's combination of lateral quickness pure physicality, attention to detail, and trash talk make him the NBA's most lethal old-school enforcer. Ever since he entered the league back in 2012, the product of Michigan State in Draymond has earned his salary off living rent-free in his opponent's heads. If I were Steph Curry, Jordan Poole, or Klay Thompson, I'd feel safe knowing the league's most intimidating trash talker has my back at all costs. For the Celtics, in just the first eight minutes of the game, Jalen Brown dropped 13 points on 67% shooting, along with three triples. After the altercation with Draymond where there was some pushing and shoving, Jalen was pretty much done after that. Nemanja Bialica was surprisingly elite off the bench, as Nemi showed off his perimeter defense on Jason Tatum and scored a few critical baskets to extend the advantage in the early going. The Warriors' playmakers off the dribble I thought were putting much more pressure on the Celtics' defense than they were in Game 1, and after that penetration, they were making the correct passing reads out of traps and doubles. Committing far too much pressure up top to Stephen Curry and other Warrior ball handlers, there were holes which the Dubs creators easily exploited in the Celtics' defensive sets. Overall, I think Golden State displayed exactly why it's so tough to beat them four times within a seven-game series. The brilliant mid-series adjustments from their coaching staff, combined with the flawless execution from Stephen Curry, Klay Thompson, and Draymond Green. As Klay said before the game, this Warrior team plays much better when they're desperate, and with Boston showing a clear lack of urgency on the other side, Golden State's pick-and-roll creators mindfully and aggressively dictated the pace of play, and when Splash Brother number 3 Jordan Poole started to get it flowing near the end of quarter number 3, topping it off with a deadly deep-range bomb to close out the frame, we all knew it was over after that. Golden State sped up, trapped, and blitzed Tatum, Smart, and Brown all night long, and I thought some of the reads from the Celtic ball handlers were frankly embarrassingly bad. Whether it's the Jays, Derek White, or Peyton Pritchard, if Boston is going to win this series and achieve the ultimate glory, those guys have to make better reads and reactions to Warrior coach Steve Kerr's game plan. One positive for Boston is the fact that Coach Udoka knew his team had already stolen home court advantage in the fourth quarter and didn't risk an injury to his best guys, sitting them down with 10 plus minutes left in the fourth. I thought that was actually smart from Ime considering a potential X Factor and Aaron Nesmith got some run. It was great to see the sophomore out there running the show in a finals game. It was also great to see my fellow Torontonian Nick Stauskas come in and drain a three. And the Celtics even swelled some of the Warriors' momentum in that fourth. 
However, when it really mattered most, and the starters graced the floor, the team from the Bay Area was the far more dominant team on Sunday, and it's going to take a flurry of adjustments from Coach Udoka for Boston to bounce back on Wednesday. Having said that, the Warriors have to be prepared, considering the Celtics are an undefeated 6-0 in these playoffs after coming off a loss. But along with bothering Tatum, Game 2 saw the Dubs lock in on the Warrior role players in Derek White, Al Horford, and Marcus Smart. Those three guys combined for just 16 points after combining for 65 in the Game 1 win. Obviously, there's no excuse for the inconsistencies from those three crucial contributors. They need to be a lot better. After making 21 of their 41 triples in Game 1 as a team, the Celtics still made a solid 15 of their 37 deep range bombs on Sunday. Andrew Wiggins and Klay Thompson shot a combined 8 for 31 for Golden State, yet the Warriors had already ended the game with about every minute remaining in the final quarter. Those numbers show you exactly how dominant of a win it was for the Dubs to even this best of seven showdown at one game apiece. Golden State's typical unsung hero in Kevon Looney was coming off a game one showing where he grabbed six offensive rebounds and one of the most underrated centers in basketball stayed consistent on Sunday as Looney Tunes was tied with both Stephen Curry and shockingly Otto Porter Jr. for the team lead in plus minus at plus 24. The Dubs went on a blistering 11-0 third quarter run and a 10-0 run the quarter before that, visibly getting under the young Celtics skin with their physicality. Then again, this is a Celtics team that didn't play their best for three quarters in game one, yet still ended up winning by 12. Boston faces and responds to adversity better than any other team in the association. Having said that, this is the Warriors. But here's what really makes these 2022 finals so frustratingly difficult to predict. One squad in the three-time champion winning Warriors with three bona fide future Hall of Famers get inconsistent production out of the supporting cast around Steph Curry, whereas this up-and-coming feisty Celtic squad has all the talent in the world, but their better players are younger than Golden State's, and Boston's also inconsistent as a team with their slow starts and turnovers. Both teams have unpredictable qualities, but one thing I can tell you without any uncertainty is the fact that with this series deadlocked at one, we're about to witness a thrilling next couple weeks of NBA basketball. There's so much at stake for both teams, one who's looking to etch their names in the Larry O'Brien trophy for the first time as a group, and another who's looking to cement their dynasty. By no means am I making a prediction, but this series may just come down to the Warriors having the best and most legendary talent on the floor, as in his storied career on the biggest stage, Golden State's floor general Stephen Curry is one of three players ever, averaging 25-5-5 on at least 55% true shooting in the NBA Finals, with the only others being LeBron James and Michael Jordan. I'm going to ask you this. What did Game 2 say about these NBA Finals? Best answer down below in the comments gets next video shout out. Top 5 commenters by June 21st receive free NBA merch this summer, so leave your take on today's question to compete in Community Speaks. Shout out for my last two videos to Thierry and Irvin Alexar Guerra. Pause to read their takes along with the honorable mentions. Appreciate you guys so much. I hope you have a great one. DFlow signing off.